Okay, I guess uh, we are all here, so we can make a start. Uh, I'm going to continue today on um, symmetry and on stereographic projections, and we'll go on to doing stereographic projection of non-cubic cells in the later half lecture. So just to revise a little bit, uh, you remember this crystal of gypsum from a previous lecture where we worked out that there's a two-fold axis going in this direction and that there is a mirror plane here. Uh, and therefore, the two-fold axis is normal to the mirror plane. The point group of gypsum is 2 upon m. And if you look at a uh, point group table, then 2 upon m corresponds to a monoclinic crystal structure. So the chris uh, you can work out that gypsum has a monoclinic crystal structure just by looking at the equilibrium shape of the crystal. And similarly, in the case of epsomite, for this crystal, we have a twofold axis going through this edge and then this through, e through this edge and vertically through the crystal. And therefore, this point group symmetry is 2 to 2. And from that, we see that it should be orthorhombic. So there are these seven crystal classes. And in total, there are 22 point groups. Okay, So the, these are the total set of point groups you can get consistent with these crystal classes. And I've said to you that it's not something that you need to remember because there are point group tables, just like the ones that I've shown you. And I'll come to point group representation shortly. But one of the representations we've done already uh, on a stereographic projection if we take this point 1 and we rotate by 180 degrees and then invert it through the center, then we get exactly a mirror plane. And this point here is represented on the equatorial plane of the stereo as a single point. We, when we do a rotation through 180 degrees, it generates another point here. And then when we invert through the center, we end up with a circle because we are now projecting through the lower hemisphere. And therefore, we have a mirror plane over here. Yeah. And you can see that the point 3 is an exact reflection of point 1 about this plane here. So everyone happy with that? Okay. So what we've done is we've represented that operation on a stereographic projection. A lot easier to do than drawing out this complicated diagram. Similarly, other point groups can be represented on the stereogram. So here I have a stereogram, and I've got a fourfold axis here. If I put a point at an arbitrary location on that, and then I operate with the symmetry element, then I'll generate another stereogram showing me where an arbitrary point will end up on that diagram. So here, for example, I've placed an arbitrary point located over here. If I now operate on that point with this fourfold axis, then I generate another one here after a rotation of 90 degrees, another rotation of 90 degrees, and another rotation of 90 degrees. So this is a stereographic representation of the point group 4, yeah. just like we had it for bar 2. Here's another example. So we have a strange looking symbol here because it's a triangle, which is for a triad. But we also have this dot in the middle, which means a center of symmetry, okay? an inversion center. I take an arbitrary dot here, and I rotate it through 120 degrees. I generate this. Okay? And similarly, another 120 degree rotation, I generate this. But for each of these, I can also invert through the center because I've got a bar on top, right? And therefore, that generates this circle, this generates this circle, and this generates this circle. So this is the stereographic representation of the point group bar 3, OK? And all of these can be generated by just taking one point and doing the symmetry operations that are illustrated. So here are the 32 point groups that I was talking about. 
not 22, 32 point groups. On the right hand side of each of these diagrams, you have the symmetry elements illustrated. And you have to look a little bit carefully, but wherever there are heavy, heavy lines like this, that corresponds to a mirror plane. So these are, uh, th this outer circle here is a mirror plane, but these are lighter lines and they're not mirror planes. Similarly, this is not uh, a mirror plane. These are, of course, the tetrads, the dyads, and the triads. And on the other side is what happens if you take a single point and operate with the symmetry elements, just like we did in the last example. Okay? So there are 32 stereograms representing the symmetry elements, and there are 32 further stereograms showing what happens to an arbitrary point Okay, so a point located somewhere not at a symmetry element, and you operate on that with all the symmetry elements. So where is bar three? Here's, here's the bar three example that we did. Okay, and um, what else did we do? We did a four. Here's a four. So those were simple examples. This is also divided into seven crystal classes where you know, we have the trigonal, the hexagonal, cubic, triclinic, monoclinic, and tetragonal, and this bit is the orthorhombic. So these are standard point group tables which are available in most uh, crystallogra crystallography books. And in this row here, and in this row, the crystals have a center of symmetry. Okay? Now for all the other crystals, they do not have centers of symmetry. And it's on those crystals that you can get effects like ferroelectricity and piezoelectricity and so forth. But if you have a center of symmetry, then supposing I deform the crystal, then all the charges are deformed uniformly. Yeah? Whereas if I don't have a center of symmetry and I deform the crystal, then you will get a dipole developing. Okay? So that's piezoelectricity. If I hit a crystal, I get a spark. So if you want to find properties like piezoelectricity, then you would look at those crystals which do not have a center of symmetry. Okay? Right. Here is uh, another example. Um, just to show you that when we use heavy lines here, they indicate mirror planes. So here we have three mirror planes uh, mutually perpendicular, MMM. If I take an arbitrary point and do this operation, I will generate this kind of a pattern on a stereogram. Okay, so here's a, a crystal of uh, lead titanate. And I've slightly exaggerated uh, some of the atomic positions to show you, for example, that the titanium is not actually located exactly at half height. Okay? So can, can you have a close look at this diagram and tell me what is the point group symmetry of the titanium atom? What are the symmetry elements passing through the titanium atom? So this is a tetragonal structure. Tetragonal means this length is equal to this length, but this is different, and all the angles are 90 degrees. So what are the point uh, uh, what are the symmetry elements passing through the titanium atom? Sorry? Which way? Upwards? So I would say that's a fourfold axis because it's tetragonal. So the uh, two cell lattice parameters, X and Y, are equal. Yeah? Um, so there's a fourfold axis passing through here. Anything else? Right. Uh, this way and that way. But isn't there also a mirror plane? Where is the mirror plane? It's, it's vertical, parallel to the axis, isn't it? Yeah. So there's a mirror plane here and a mirror plane here. Yeah. So how would I write that? How would I write the point group symmetry of the titanium? 4 mm, correct, yeah? How about the um, lead atom? Is, 
it's a little bit more difficult to see because they are located at the corners, but again, it's 4 mm. Okay. And the oxygen atom here? Yeah, so there's a fourfold axis here, but why over? Why over? At right, but I don't have a mirror plane here because this titanium atom is not exactly at half height. Yeah, four mm is uh, again correct for this. How about this oxygen atom? What's the point group symmetry for this? which is on the center of the face. There's only a dyad passing through that because it's, it's going, going in. Can you see that? There's no fourfold axis for the oxygen atoms at height half. Okay? So in this structure, we do not have a, a center of symmetry. Okay, now I'm going to show you a much more complicated structure. There you go. This is uh, lead niobate, all right? And lead niobate is a pyroelectric substance. Uh, pyroelectric means if I apply an electrical field, it'll become hot, or if I make it hot, it'll generate an electrical field. And the special thing about this structure is that this direction is not the same as its opposite. Okay, so focus on this atom here, the blue atom. If I go downwards, I come to the green atom at a shorter distance than if I go upwards. Okay, so even without doing anything, there is a dipole there. Uh, you know, there's a these these atoms have different charges, and even without deforming the crystal or heating it up you've still got a charge there, right? A net charge. Do you see that? This is called a unique direction because going upwards is not the same as going downwards. Yeah, can you see that? Okay, now, of course, this is a very complicated looking structure, but if I draw a structure projection, then you might be able to recognize uh, a, a symmetry element. So this is a, a structure projection with the lithium, the uh, not lead niobate, but lithium niobate. Um, can you spot any symmetry axes passing through the plane of the board? Okay, so you could argue this is sixfold, right, here? But notice that we have that, that, and that. So what would it be? Threefold. Yeah. This is a trigonal structure. So there's a threefold axis passing normal to the plane of the board. Okay. Now you've seen uh, several applications of point groups. Uh, the first one was um, to deduce the crystal structure just by looking at the equilibrium shape of the crystal. Uh, can you point out another example? Well, we looked at the point group symmetries of interstitial sites. Do you remember? That the uh, octahedral site in ferrite actually has tetragonal symmetry, whereas the octahedral site in austenite is a regular octahedron, so it's a 4 mmm. Yeah? And that had a profound effect on the properties of ferrite and austenite when it came to the role of carbon atoms inside your crystal. Okay? And today we've seen that you know, if your structure doesn't have a center of symmetry, then it will give you peculiar properties, which you don't normally get if your center of symmetry. And there are many, many such examples that you come across in your research on crystals. 
Also, notice that structure projections are much nicer to look at than three-dimensional models where you can't really perceive everything properly. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to uh, stereographic projections for crystals which are not cubic. Now, with a cubic crystal, uh, you can treat a plane normal and a direction very similarly because a 100 direction is exactly parallel to a 100 plane normal. Okay? Or a 112 direction is exactly parallel to a 112 plane normal. That is no longer the case if your crystal is, crystal axes are not cubic. So here is an example. This is a two dimensional crystal where we have, uh, you know, a parameter which is different from the B parameter. And this is the 1, 1 direction. Okay, so we are using square brackets, you remember, for directions. And this is the 1, 1 plane. And the normal to the 1, 1 plane is not parallel to the 1, 1 direction. Okay. So you cannot, uh, you know, s do dot products and cross products in a simple way as you do for cubic systems. The 1, 1 direction is no longer parallel to the 1, 1 plane normal. And that is a general rule. Of course, if I take a special direction like this, this is the 1, 0 direction, it is parallel to the 1, 0 plane normal, but not as a general rule. Okay? So you have to be very careful when you talk about unit cells which are not cubic. Even, even uh, Orthorhombic, you know, where the angles are 90 degrees, but if the cell edges are not 90 degrees, you cannot assume that the plane normal is parallel to the direction. So here we have a, a stereogram for a cubic system, okay. and this is the 100 zero zero plane normal, 0, 1, 0 plane normal, and 0, zero 1 plane normal exactly as we did in the last lecture. Okay. And I've labeled here a 110 pole, which if you look, this is a great circle, and if I add 100 and 010, I get 110. So it's in the correct location. If I add this and this, I get a 111. 110 plus 001. So that's lying on that great circle and so on. Can somebody tell me what this is? Yep. 0, 1, 1, and how about, um, okay, how about this one here? Yeah, because the opposite of that is bar 1, 0, 0. Therefore, bar 1, 0, 0 plus 0, 1, 0 will give me bar 1, 1, 0, and so on, okay? So I'm not actually plotting these exactly now because you need to plot with the correct angle Okay, but everything should be consistent that if you have two vectors on a plane, every other vector can be generated by a linear combination of those two. So to define a plane, you only need two vectors. And this is our cubic lattice, and you can see that the one one plane, uh, the normal to this plane is the same as this direction. So the one one direction is exactly parallel to the one one plane. Now let's look at an orthorhombic crystal, so the angles are still 90 degrees, but the lattice parameters are all different. So here I have lattice parameters 2, 3, and 8. Here I have a lattice parameter of 5. Uh, there's only one lattice parameter for a cubic system. So notice that we are plotting, again, plane normals, and look at the distortion that you get in going from cubic to orthorhombic. Yeah? So this 1, 1 normal is rotated because the A, B, and C axes are not equal. Yeah. So all of these are spread towards the edges compared with the cubic stereogram. Okay. So we normally plot poles on stereogram, and when you have a non-cubic system, you will get variations like this. Um, let me see now. Is there any fourfold axis here?
here there's no question that's a fourfold axis yeah you can see the symmetry there yeah how about in this case is there any fourfold axis yeah. just imagine it's autorhombic yeah so a does not equal b does not equal c so there's no possibility of a fourfold axis it's two 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 the, the edges are all dials so here if I rotate by 180 degrees I would reproduce this but if I rotate by 90 degrees I would not because look this is different yeah okay so we've distorted the stereogram by making it autorhombic okay um, I should have done that previously just to show you these distortions here okay that this th this uh, vector here has moved closer to zero one zero by expanding the lattice parameters now you see um, if I change the lattice parameters of the autorhombic crystal from two three eight to two three five the stereogram also changes so with the cubic system there is only one stereogram doesn't matter what the lattice parameters are because on the stereogram you plot angular relationships okay but if you have a unit cell which is not cubic then the stereogram depends on the lattice parameters because the angles will depend on the lattice parameters okay so here you have two stereograms from the orthorhombic crystal and they both look different because the lattice parameters are different so you cannot assume that you have an autorhombic stereogram. The autorhombic stereogram is relevant for a particular set of lattice parameters. Everyone happy with that? So we've got a complication that you can't just say I've got an autorhombic stereogram. You have to specify what lattice parameters that corresponds to. Okay? Right now there's a further problem because directions and plane normals are not parallel we need two stereograms okay so these are both have the same lattice parameter here we are plotting plane normals here we are plotting directions okay so it's the same lattice parameters orthorhombic but you've seen that a direction is no longer parallel to a plane normal in general okay it's only the edges where you get exactly the same positions here and here the middle but all the others the plane normals are no longer parallel to direction so you need two stereograms if you want to deal with directions and plane normals so you know we are very very lucky in steels the major phases are both cubic okay austenite and ferrite but you go to cementite you're in trouble because what is the structure of cementite orthorhombic okay so you have to think differently about plane normals and directions when it comes to cementite of course there is another form of iron right apart from cubic I and cubic F what is that form hmm? yeah hexagonal close back so there's a whole class of issues with hexagonal close back structures which we will look at now so hexagonal close back iron doesn't just occur in the middle of the earth but you know if you add enough manganese into your alloy you will get epsilon iron stable at room, temp uh, room temperature and pressure so the hexagonal lattice is you have a lattice parameter a here a and the angle is 120 degrees and there's a very peculiar effect so let me just uh, draw the hexagonal cell okay the C axis is pointing out of the plane of the diagram this angle here is 120 degrees this is a and this is a and this is our uh, unit cell this direction is 100 zero, zero. this direction is zero one zero okay now 
if I draw a line over here, then what is the nature of this triangle? Sorry? Is there a special name for such triangles? Equilateral, right? That means, hmm? Did, is that what you said? Okay, okay. Uh, so I haven't drawn the diagram very well, okay? <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. But it should be an equilateral triangle. That means all the edges are e equal length and all the angles are 60 degrees. So if I locate an atom here, 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 and here, there is absolutely no difference between this direction and this direction. Yeah. What are the indices of this direction? Mm -hmm. So we have a problem. Yeah. These are all crystallographically equivalent directions and yet they have different indices. Yeah? Remember we talked about crystallographically equivalent directions that in the cube, you know, one zero zero is exactly identical in terms of atomic arrangement to zero one zero and zero zero one. So we use uh, angular brackets to identify that they are crystallographically equivalent. Here, one zero zero is equivalent to one one zero is equivalent to zero one zero. And of course, it's not equivalent to 0, 0, 001, which is the C axis. Okay? So these are all crystallographically equivalent directions. And to cope with this, there's a different set of indices that we use, which are called the Miller Brave indices. So we use four indices so that they appear to be equivalent. They are called the Miller Brave indices. Right, before I go on to that, uh, you can see this is a, a stereogram. I'll just make it bigger. For the hexagonal system. So here we have the C axis, uh, the uh, plane normal to the basal plane of the hexagon. Uh, this is the 100 zero zero plane normal. And this is the zero one zero plane normal. What is the angle between the zero one zero and the one zero zero plane normal? Sixty degrees, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this angle is one hundred twenty degrees. So how come we plotted this plane normal at sixty degrees? So, the zero one zero plane is this plane. Uh, sorry, that's the one zero zero plane. Okay. And the normal to that plane is this. So that's the one zero zero. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? And the plane which intersects the y axis. Away is this, and its plane normal is this, and the angle between those two is 60 degrees. It's not the same as the angle between the directions, which is 120 degrees. Yeah? So the angle between the normal to this plane and this plane is 60 degrees, but the angle between this and this is 120 degrees because it's no longer cubic. Plane normals and directions are not parallel. Okay? 
So when you're plotting a hexagonal stereogram and you're plotting poles, you have to be careful that 100 and 010 make an angle of 60 degrees. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Right, but the same sort of rules apply that this is 100, zero, zero, this is 010, zero, zero, and this is a plane equivalent to, to those two but with different indices. If I add this and this, I get this, okay? So if I've defined two vectors, then every other vector in that plane is generated by a linear combination, okay? Right, now I've got to solve this uh, problem that this plane which is this plane here uh, so this this plane here is exactly identical to the other two but has different indices its indices are bar 1 1 0 right now there's a very simple solution so we have these three planes which are crystallographically equivalent. If you look at the atomic arrangement on those three planes, they are exactly identical, okay? And yet, the numbers inside the brackets are not identical. We can't generate this by simply permuting one and zero and zero. So they are all of the form one zero zero crystallographically equivalent, what we do is we add a fourth index, right? So this is an extra index, which is minus the sum of the first two, right? So instead of just HKL, the three index system, you add an index I, and I is equal to minus H plus K. And then all of them have the same form, permutations of the same numbers. So 100 zero zero becomes 10 zero bar 10, one zero. Zero one zero becomes zero 01 bar 10, one zero. and bar 110 one zero is simply bar 1 bar 100. Zero zero. If you want to go back to a three index system, you just delete this third index. So these are called the Miller Brave indices, and in almost all textbooks and in publications, they will use the four index notation for hexagonal materials. Yeah, so some of you are working on magnesium, right? Is anyone working on magnesium? Okay, so we obviously don't have Nakjun Kim students over here, <laughs> but uh, if you are working on magnesium, you'll see the publications all have four index notations, and that's in order to ensure that crystallographically equivalent directions, uh, plane normals, have the same permutations of numbers. Okay, so now this is the hexagonal stereogram in four index notation. So remember, I can just strike out the third index if we are talking about plane normals. So this is effectively the one zero zero plane normal. This is the zero one zero plane normal, and this is the bar one one zero plane normal. But now all three of these have identical permutations of numbers, right? And again, the same rule applies that I can, I can generate this by adding this and this and so on. Okay? Everyone happy with that? <coughs> okay, so life uh, gets a little bit more complicated when we come to directions with four indices. Now, there is a rule which is called the Weiss zone rule, which we will prove when we do the reciprocal lattice. And that is that if I have a direction U, V, W, okay, and a plane normal, H, K, L, and if I multiply H, U, K, V, and L, W, and I get a zero, that means that the direction U, V, W necessarily lies in the plane H, K, L. Okay? And that applies to any unit cell, whether it's cubic, orthorhombic, whatever. If I have a plane H, K, L,
so the wise um, wise zone rule. So I have a plane H K L and a direction U V W. If that direction lies in that plane, then H U plus K V plus L W equals zero for any unit cell. Not just cubic, okay? Now, the reason for this you won't understand right now, but it's because a plane normal is a vector in the reciprocal lattice and a direction is a vector in real space. You will get to this, we will get to this later on in the lectures. So the Weiss zone rule applies to any crystal system, whether it's cubic, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, whatever. And if we go to a four index notation, then we have to satisfy a similar Weiss zone rule. So instead of just having, uh, so these capital letters are the four index notation for directions in the hexagonal system. Miller-Bravé lattices for directions, and HKIL are the Miller-Bravé lattices for plane normals. So this is, if you like, the white zone rule for the Miller-Bravé lattices. And you've got to define U, V, J, and W in such a way that this white zone rule is also satisfied. So I'm not going to go through the maths. It's actually very trivial. But when you go through it, it's, it's in the notes that you can download. Yeah, have you managed to access the PDF file for this lecture course? Yeah, is everyone familiar with that? There, there are comprehensive printed notes available. Do you know that? Does anybody not know that? Okay, good, so everybody knows that. So there are simple rules for converting uh, three index notation, UVW, into the four index notation. So here, here are the rules. And if you do it in that way, then the Weiss zone rule is satisfied. So for example, the 100 zero zero direction becomes this, and so on. So you can see these all have the same permutations of numbers, whereas these do not, okay? Right, so that's quite a lot to, lot to absorb today. But in the case of non-cubic systems, you have to be careful that plane normals are not going to be parallel to directions of the same indices. And that when you have a stereogram, it will depend the positions of the poles will depend on the lattice parameters and the angles and so forth. And furthermore, you have to have a separate stereogram for directions as well as for plane normals. Now, it's not as difficult as it seems because these days you can get computer programs to plot the stereogram for you. But it's good to understand these things. Okay, that's all for today. <laughs>